that expresses a person, not a person that expresses a body, which you'll see why later, but I just wrote that wrong. Okay, <laughs> so you can fix that with arrows. Okay, my talk has two parts. The second part is the kind of direct response to Professor Waldstein, but the first part is necessary, it's necessary for us to just philosophize with Wojtyla a bit in order to understand the impact of the second part. So we can just do that. Theology is the study of God, and theology of the body has obviously a prominent dimension related directly to God. It also has a human dimension, man and woman, he created them. The two dimensions are intimately and integrally related. This is perhaps the main point. I would like to focus in on the human dimension in my remarks this morning. While both dimensions, and especially in their integration, are beginning to draw many people, in particular young people, into a living relationship with church teaching on sexuality that they had never known before, I would like today to point out one particular aspect of the human dimension that in my teaching experience seems to profoundly attract people to theology of the body. Within this human dimension, there are two parts, the unitive and the procreative. These are and must be integrally and intimately related. Willfully to separate them is immoral and leads to the destruction of both of them. It is, however, possible to talk about them separately in order to get a clear understanding of what they each are. Some hold the view that even talking about them separately can be problematic, an early sign of dualism, perhaps. But John Paul II was not afraid of that criticism. That is because of his trust in the truth, and in particular in the goodness of the truth. He knew that exploring the meaning of the unitive dimension of spousal relations, focusing in on its inner meaning, not only could never lead to a separation of the procreative and unitive meanings, but could only lead to a fuller understanding of both, also to a fuller understanding of their inseparability. I think that perhaps the primary source of attraction, particularly for young people today in Theology of the Body, comes from John Paul's presentation of the unitive dimension of spousal relations. My students always often write that in their, in their essays. And so, what then is this profound expression of the unitive meaning of spousal relations given by John Paul, which has such power to fill a void in the hearts and minds of people today, young people, especially perhaps broken and fed up with divorce and broken homes? While the unitive and procreative dimensions are and should be insepar inseparable in reality, there is a meaningful conceptual distinction, and I would like to explore that now. Oitiwa, John Paul II, needed to probe the inner life of persons, also known as their subjectivity. And he tells us time and again in many of his works, including T.O.B., that it is contemporary anthropology or personalism which made this new awareness possible. I'm not obviously going to read any of my footnotes to you, but I back up in the notes with texts from Love and Responsibility and Theology of the Body, the points I make, and I underline in bold together the lines that make the point most strongly. You have some there already on that page. So three prominent themes in theology of the body. We may begin by pointing out three foundational principles of theology of the body. I do not mean that these are the only foundational principles. They are just three prominent guiding themes of the text. And they are that the invisible determines man more than the visible. You are your body is the second one. And the third one, look, a body that expresses a person. The first one. Let us begin with, let us be, um, starting with the second one there. Let us begin with the expression, you are your body. The Pope says this many times with slight variations throughout theology of the body. What does it mean? Well, there is another prominent contemporary group of thinkers who say this also. They are called materialists or epiphenomenalists. They believe that you are your body in the sense that you have no soul. They would say your brain, not your soul, is the source of your conscious life. It therefore follows from this view that there can be no afterlife. If your body, your brain, is the cause of you, then when it, your brain, dies, you are gone. This is the most prominent view in university psychology and philosophy departments today, and it is also the most prominent view in hospital ethics boards and government legislators. It's the view which is the foundation of the pro-euthanasia, pro-abortion movement. When John Paul said so often, you are your body, do you think he meant to deny the existence of the soul like these materialists? I would hope not as the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. So what did he mean when he said, you are your body? 
He was, I think, grasping for words to express a mystery which words can hardly capture. The immediacy of the invisible within us, our soul, in our body. <clears throat> Some mysteries in the universe are so profound that we have to grope and grasp for language to express them. Language is not capable of adequately expressing some profound mysteries. The immediacy of our soul and our body is one of those mysteries. And it is for this reason that the Pope said, it seems to me, you are your body. Okay, the second of these three foundational themes. This brings us to the next theme. The invisible determines man more than the visible. We could, to help get a handle on this idea, think of the universe as divided into two worlds. The visible, which includes the trees, animals, earth, planets, etc., and the invisible. And on the human level, that means our inner life, the invisible. Also referred to as our subjectivity, there are, in the invisible, inner life of persons, many things. Thoughts, feelings, decisions, for example, among them. These are realities, yet they are not made out of matter. You cannot knock on a, on, a, on a feeling or paint any of them blue. And spatial categories do not apply to them. It would be absurd to say that my sorrow has a five-inch diameter and is to the left of my joy. <laughs> <laughs> what Voitiva means is that this inner spiritual life of persons, the invisible, determines us more deeply than the material the bodily. Be sure that this is in no way a negative statement about the body, as we will see. And the third theme. And now to the third. Look, a body that expresses a person. This theme especially is drawn from the phenomenologists Max Shaler and St. Edith Stein. The ways in which the immaterial person is expressed in and through the body are astounding. How can one human person express their inner immaterial life to another? There are many ways. I'm going to go through about five of them right now. And I have a footnote there about Dr. Seifert because in his book, Leib und Seele, he collected, you could say, these ideas from the various phenomenologists and unified them and developed them. So in, for many of these points, I'm relying on that book of his. Sense perception. This is quite amazing. Consider that now, right this minute, I am thinking of meaningful ideas. Hopefully. And then I want you to think those thoughts too. The thoughts are immaterial, and yet I am able to express them with my mouth and breath, creating sound waves which then hit your eardrums, making them vibrate. You don't even feel that vibration. Instead, something utterly amazing happens. The immaterial meaning that I was thinking, you now understand and think and think about. Sense perception has many physical, bodily, causal processes to it, but mysteriously, it does not end there with a vibrating eardrum, but rather, we can transcend to each other, like right now, by sharing immaterial meaning elements with each other, and sense perception is mediating our inner lives to each other right this minute. That is one way the inner life of persons is expressed in and through the body. Secondly, the immediate presence of the person in the body, if someone, like your father, pats you on the back, you do not say, Hmm, interesting, that hand must like that shoulder over there. No, you immediately feel the pride that the person who pats you feels about you. Or if someone slaps you in the face, you don't say, that hand must not like that cheek there. You feel immediately an insult from one person to another. No deduction is necessary. This is because the invisible person is immediately present in the physical body. This mystery is what John Paul is trying to express in language when he says, you are your body. Some thinkers have noted that our upright posture reflects our dignity and our ability to transcend ourselves. With our intellects, we can follow a lecture, ask a question, know truth. With our will, we can participate in the moral life, becoming good or evil. And with our heart or effective dimension, we can be moved by the beauty of a sunset or a great work of art. No dog or cat, if in this room, could ever ask me a question about what I'm saying. They do not become morally good or evil, and they cannot be moved by the beauty of a sunset. Animals cannot do these things. And our upright posture, as opposed to their hunched over posture, reveals the dignity of our rational nature immediately in our body, which is open to the whole of reality. <clears throat> Human expression. This is perhaps the most stunning case of the idea that the body expresses the inner immaterial life of persons. Our inner lasting, and also not so long lasting attitudes, both kinds, form our body. 
John Paul once said that he saw the meaning of Mother Teresa in her eyes. Or think of her little hunched over body. Never, I never met her, but people who have say they perceived immediately in her physical features the intensity of her charity and her loving attitude of radical service. Is it not utterly amazing that the posture, tone of voice, look in the eye, those are all physical, po the body, voice, and so forth, of a person that get to be that way because of their inner immaterial feelings and decisions over time. And as amazing as it is that the body and facial expression of a person are formed by how they think, feel, and decide, it is almost even more amazing that other persons can immediately and accurately feel or know the invisible inner life of another precisely because it is expressed in the body directly. That's the first stage of Edith Stein's three stages of of empathy to the question before. Um, this goes for negative attitudes as well. You see two things, a facial expression or a certain bodily posture, and also in that face or body, the arrogance or rude disdain in the soul of a person whose face or body is so. Another way our body expresses our person, each person's uniqueness. One of the deepest sources of the lofty worth of persons is their uniqueness. If you ask yourself why you love a person whom you love and then try to put the answer into words, you might come up with things like it's because of their laugh or the way they walk. But strictly speaking, laughter or walking are not what you love. You love a person who is expressed in the laugh or walk. You perceive quite directly the utter uniqueness of who this someone is in their laugh. And this is because their uniqueness impresses itself upon or in their laugh. This uniqueness of someone is known when you love them, and it is the deepest source of the worth of persons. Western philosophy has rightly pointed out that our rational nature is what makes us higher than the animals. Yet, strictly speaking, even a rational nature as such is not a person. No one, upon meeting a new friend or falling in love, declares, guess what? Today I met a functioning intellect or a free will. You say, I, today I met a person. This person was expressed to me through an intellect and a will, a laugh or a walk. Those are things all other people have. But I met a person, a unique person. So those five or six points are meant to bring out the truth that the fullness of the inner immaterial life of persons, their subjectivity, is really expressed in our bodies in astounding in various ways. Some thoughts on self-donation. Have you ever wondered what the phrase self-donation actually means in a philosophical sense? As Dr. Wallerstein has pointed out, Gaudium et Spes 24.3 is, is A, perhaps the primary text from Vatican II out of which Wojtyla developed his idea of self-donation. Man is the only creature that God has created for his, man's own sake, yet man can only discover or become himself by making a sincere gift of himself. The first half of this quote, these both halves were talked about quite a lot by Professor Wallstein. I'll just talk about them briefly right now. The first half expresses the idea that persons are ends and not means. And by the way, the term end, it seems to me, is a language tool to get across the idea that persons should never be treated as a means in a means end relationship. A means gets its worth from something outside of itself. A hammer is worthy only if it functions for building a house. If it is cracked, you toss it. A hammer is a means. Slave owners treat their slaves as if they get their worth exclusively from whether or not they can accomplish the goals of the slave owner. If not, they toss them. The reason for our revulsion at that way of acting is because we know that persons have within them a deep source of worth or deep sources of worth. And a slave owner is behaving as if these slaves who are persons are intrinsically within them worthless and only get worth added on if they can do certain things. This is actually the case with a hammer. The intensity of the inner worth of each person is expressed by many authors who respect that worth by naming persons ends in order to distinguish them from means. Calling them ends in this sense in no way implies that an author thinks humans are God or that God does not exist. It just points to the inviolable worth of each person, the inner worthiness that is found. This inner worthiness, that's the first half of the quote. Um, 
So, and there's one beautiful text in Emmanuel Kant where he brings this point up, and, and this is, maybe I could expressly say one of my first criticisms is while there are also texts, rightly what you say, I think there are many texts in Kant and Schiller where they're just doing this. They're just trying to show, like many other authors have, that a person isn't a means. And some of the places, I, maybe you go a little too far in some of the, interpreting some of the texts beyond that. Um, okay, one obvious form, excuse me, the second half expresses the structure of personal existence. And it appears at first glance to be a contradiction. Normally when you give something away, like my keys for example, it is gone from you. Yet in this quote it is said that if you give something away, namely yourself, you have it more. Could that be a real giving? One obvious form of self-donation is called sacrifice. There is the sacrifice of superficial goods, such as chocolate during Lent, in order to focus our attention on the deeper things of life. And there is also the sacrifice of deep goods for others, such as Maximilian Kolbe sacrificing his life for another man, or mother, a mother sacrificing much needed sleep for her child. In these cases of giving of self, it does become clear that in a way we become more truly who we are and are meant to be precisely because of the giving in the form of sacrifice. But sacrifice is only one of the forms of self-donation. And while it is most certainly an extremely important dimension of marriage, it is not the form of self-donation primarily explored by Wojtyla and JP2 in Love and Responsibility and Theology of the Body. The name for the type of self-donation that could be, that what he explores could be termed revealing. Revealing differs from sacrifice as a form of self-donation because in sacrifice, the good that is given is lost, chocolate, sleep, one's life. But in revealing, the good that is given is not lost, your inner life, but shared with or shown to another person. Here we come, I think, and the human dimension of TOB, to the heart of the human dimension of theology of the body and the spousal meaning of the body. The body reveals the intimate, inner, invisible being of the spouses to each other. This can happen because we are not separate from our bodies, but we are immediately present in our bodies, or as John Paul says, we are our bodies. The opposite of this view that I've just been describing is known as dualism and the most concise expression I have heard of it is quoted by John Crosby in one of his books he mentions a representative of one of the more radically feminist movements but one which has not outright rejected God who said once quote God does not care what we do with our bodies he only cares he just wants us to respect each other as persons that's a pretty concise formulation of this view. Now, um, I, I do not recommend what I'm about to say actually doing it, but if you went up to the person who said that quote and slapped her in the face, and then she became angry with you, I don't think she would accept a response by you that ran, oh, that was just my hand in your cheek, but I respect you as a person. <laughs> she wouldn't. Or, and I do recommend this, if you smiled warmly at her or gave her a hug, I think she would feel consoled in her very person. How odd is the view of so many dualists today who would be hurt by a slap or a sneer or encouraged by a hug and at the same moment conceive of sex as divorced from the ability to touch their person. Indeed, if a mere pat on the back reveals immediately, for example, pride, the inner life and feelings of one person to another, then how much more sex? Self-donation, in the sense of revealing the intimate inner life of persons to each other, is made possible through human sexuality precisely because of this mysterious but undeniable immediate presence of our immaterial dimension in our body. Now, I'm going to speak a little freely about shame because I didn't write this, this part, but it seems to me, and then we'll come back to the text in about two minutes, it seems to me that the, the primary way that Wojtyla and John Paul II tries to get at deep in the points I've been trying to make just now is through shame. And I'm going to say more specifically something about why he came to this in relation to Schaller in part two. 
But in Love and Responsibility, he distinguishes between two types of shame. One is called shame, I'm calling it shame of the negative. And that's the one we're all familiar with. That is, you do something immoral or foolish, and it, it, people know or you feel ashamed before God or before other people who find out. But shame um, also, um, there's another thoroughly positive, and Hildebrand also talks about, there's a very, there's a very common point between Hildebrand and Wojtyla, as Dr. Waldstein mentioned earlier. Um, if, I'm going to do this with an example. If, if you were here with a close friend of yours and they said to you, they said, I want to tell you a, a, something personal, a very deep feeling or thought I'm having, a, really, a very good one, and they share this personal thing with you. And then we came to the lecture here, and then someone in the audience came to the mic and said, excuse me, I have an announcement to make. And they tell all of us in the room what the person said. Then the person's going to feel shame. Why? Because it's something negative, bad? No, we just said it's something good. So it seems, and this is what Wojtyla develops, and so does Hildebrand, that there's a shame, as surprising as this sounds, that we feel about things that are good, but a specific type of good thing. A good thing which is characterized by intimacy. And by intimacy, I mean the... Um, if something is intimate about you, it means when you reveal it to another person, you reveal your very being to that person. And if that's going to happen, then the person you're revealing it to has to cherish what you share. And so the idea of the shame of the intimate, why we feel it is when something intimate is being revealed at the wrong time and to a person who can't, uh, who can't cherish you. Now, um, there are some opposites of shame that he talks about in the Metaphysics of Shame chapter, and um, one of them is called shamelessness. And shamelessness would be uh, if somebody didn't feel the two types of shame I just mentioned to you. The two types of shame I just told you about are both good. You should feel shame if you're going to do something immoral. It will help you stop, do it, or stop doing it. Or after you do something immoral, it will help you repent and change. And you should feel shame also about things that are intimate, Meaning, as he says there in Love and Responsibility, the shame is, it kind of gets expressed as a hiding of what is intimate. And the reason for that is um, to inspire love, which I'll get to in a minute. So if a person doesn't feel any shame in those two ways, they're shameless. Like they do immoral things and their conscience is dulled, no shame. Or they go, this is a bizarre thing, but these TV shows now, Oprah, Winfrey, and all those things where they get on there and tell all their intimate things to the whole, that's shameless of the intimate. So now the third point in that chapter is very beautiful. It's called the absorption of shame by love, a type of not having shame which has nothing to do with shamelessness. It's in the Metaphysics of Shame chapter. Um, now, I'm going to bring up this point with, with, a, with an example. There are many chastity speakers here, I think, and I'm sure they could confirm this, that when they give their talks, they probably get the question, something like, okay, I, someone out there in the audience would say, I agree with you that all this promiscuous behavior that's immoral, using people, we should never do that. But what if you're in love? 